Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I am uh, Heather Registers of Indon. I'm the Programs and Outreach Coordinator, the Programs and Website Coordinator. Man, I can't let go of outreach. Um, <laughs> for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. And this is the December 2023 Legacies and Lunch, a hybrid program of the Cows Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. So now until December of 2024-ish, we're going to go with, um, we will be presenting Legacies and Lunch here at UA Little Rock downtown. So like every month, I want to thank Marta and Emily for giving us a home for this program while the main library is being renovated. It's, it's been incredibly helpful. If you want to sign up for our email list um, and get information about Roberts Library programs and events, you can see Madeline in the back. I think she's here. Um, to sign up, or you can go to robertslibrary.org to sign up directly. Consider donating to the Cows Foundation to support our programs. The Butler Center for Arkansas Studies and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas would greatly appreciate your donation. You can go to robertslibrary.org or encyclopediaofarkansas.net to give a one-time or monthly recurring donation. Um, we really would appreciate it, and I think we would use your money pretty well. Today's talk is being live streamed to YouTube, and so it'll be available to view on Cal's YouTube channel immediately following the program. And if you signed up for Zoom, even if you're in person, you'll get a link to the recorded program so you can watch it over and over and over again. Um, today's speaker, that's me, will answer questions at the end of the session. So folks on Zoom, you can type your questions in the chat box and I'll read them aloud during the Q&A. For folks in person, if you'll please sil silence your cell phones, we'd greatly appreciate it. Although if you've got cool ring tones, I guess I'm okay with that. Dre's got a really cool ring tone that I just heard. Um, before I forget, and I don't want to forget at the end because I have a tendency to do that, please join us this Friday, so in two days, um, from 5 to 8 at Second Friday Art Night. Santa and Mrs. Claus will be joining us and you can get pictures and you don't have to pay for them. You take them yourself. Um, so we'll have cookies from Dempsey Bakery. There's going to be crafts for kids of or people of all ages, I guess. So you can bring your children. This is a family friendly event. Um, so again, join us here in this space, UA Little Rock downtown from five to eight on Friday. And I always want to comment or, or, set, or state that our two fan activities, any of our art programming that we do at um, Roberts is underwritten by the Wingate Foundation and we really appreciate their support. Okay, so now to the program. So today's speaker, I usually introduce the speaker. So today's speaker is me. That's me. Um, so many of you know me as the moderator of this program and other Roberts Library programs. I think for, what, two and a half years, I was a face in a box on Zoom. Um, but I am a degree-holding public historian who has worked in history museums for almost 25 years. It seems like a really long time. Um, so before coming to CALS, I worked at the Central High National Historic Site, the Old State House Museum, and Mosaic Templars. Mm -hmm. um, I also was one of the core staff members on the Life Interrupted project that highlighted mm -hmm. Japanese American incarceration in World War II Arkansas. Um, I took a brief hiatus from history to own and run the Yarn Mart in the Heights, um, and I wrote my master's thesis on Catherine Carson Breckenridge, the wife of the U.S. Minister to Russia from 1894 to 1898, and I can put that into any conversation. <laughs> I can slip a Breckenridge in any conversation. Um, people go, who is that person? Okay, so today's program is about um, my mother, and it's entitled, Are You My Mother? So I was telling people earlier, <clears throat> as a historian, we deal with dead people, and we usually deal with people that are dead enough that their relatives don't come around. Um, but today, I am doing a program in front of the subject, <laughs> who is very much alive, um, and she's probably terrified as to what I'm going to say. 
And someone said earlier, oh, I've never heard you say anything. And I said, you haven't been to doctor's appointments with us. Um, so things can come out of my mouth that are at least expected. So um, hopefully she will survive this hour and then we'll get to go to lunch. So, um, so someone asked also earlier, this is my mother here, the older of the two girls, and that's her sister, Linda. Um, that's about 1952-53. Um, they were in Detroit, Michigan at the time, and they are wearing matching Christmas outfits. That one said, a minute, aww, everybody aww. Yeah, lots of awes, mom will appreciate that. Okay, so um, Madeline was asking earlier, she was like, oh, that's a cute title, are you my mother? That was a great book. Yes, it was a great book, and and that is where the title came from. This book, um, growing up, this is one of the books that my mom read to me on a regular basis. It's called, Are You My Mother? Um, it's by P.D. Eastman. And it's about a baby bird who, if you, nobody, if you haven't read it, it's about a baby bird who falls out of the nest from a high, you know, high in the tree, and the mother has gone off to get food, and so he doesn't know what his mother looks like, and there's no mirror for him to see what he looks like, so he walks around, because he can't buy yet, he walks around and asks um, all these animals if they are his mother. Um, he even asks a boat, a plane, and a steam shovel if they are his mother. Um, but finally, in a very traditional happy ending, he is reunited with his mother, um, who looks very much like him. But as I was doing this research, I, I felt like I was asking the computer screen a lot, are you my mother? Are you the Phyllis I'm looking for? And so I kept thinking about this book because, yeah, I was, I was going through this and going, are you my mother? And at one point, it was like, please be my mother. Okay, so a little bit of educational information about the census. I know we have at least one National Archives employee here and several on Zoom, so I felt like I needed to put a plug in for them. Um, in April of 2022, the, that is not going to spill right yet, yeah, there we go. Um, in April of 2022, the 1950 U.S. Census was released by the National Archives and Records Administration. As I'm sure most of you know, every 10 years, um, the population of the United States is counted. We get counted. And do you know why this happens? Anybody? No. It's in the Constitution. It's in the Constitution. Do you know what article, section, and clause? No, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Article, Van Zavinda, do you know what article, section, and clause? Okay. I should. Article 1, section 2, clause 3 of the United States Constitution says, the actual enumeration shall be made within three years of the first meeting of the Congress of the United States and within subsequent term of 10 years in, in such matter as they, that's Congress, shall, direct, shall by law direct. So constitutionally, the census is mandated. What does it determine? House numbers. House numbers. Was that Carrie Schultz? <laughs> okay, Carrie Schultz got it. House, the number of representatives um, in the House, also distribution of taxes. So it's kind of important to be counted. Um, so this basically, bottom line, translates to voting power for us in Congress and real money to support services in our communities like your public library system. As historians and genealogists, the census is a treasure trove of information and details about our ancestors, their neighbors, which is just as important, and how our community has changed over time. So about 72, well exactly 72 years after a census is collected, the National Archives and Records Administration releases the information. They just release it. It's not indexed. It's got to be indexed. And so there's this kind of mad rush that happens, at least the past two that have been released, to get it indexed as quickly as possible um, so we can find new ancestors. And I don't know, this was, I, when I was looking for these photos of the census, I had never, I don't know that I had ever seen the the, what the census enumerator's book looked like. I think I envisioned a clipboard because I'm from the late 20th century, but these great big books is what they carried around with the sheets in them. 
So for Gen Xers like me, the 1950 census was the first time we would be able to find our parents for, for most of us. I was born in 74, so that kind of gives you a little timeline. So my dad is born in 41, my mom in 47. Um, and so the first time I was going to be able to locate them in a federal census, I'd been able to find all four of my grandparents in the, in the 1940 census, as well as my dad's older sister and brother, and of course, various other relatives. Um, the 1940 census was, was um, released in 2012. But there's something important about finding your parents in a census, in this most important of federal documents. But before we get to my mom, let's spend a second on my dad. I want to be a little equal. Um, so my dad's family lived in the, had lived in the same house, live in the, they still live there, in the same house since the 19-teens. Um, so I thought, you know, I'll open up the 1950 census. I'll give a couple of weeks for indexers to do their work. And I'll be able to type in my grandmother's name and find them. Type in Maud Graham hopefully be able to find them. And because I knew where they'd be, they would be at 429 North 2nd Street, Clarendon, Monroe County, Arkansas. So this picture here is of that side of the family. Um, they are from, from left to right, my grandmother Maud, my great-grandmother Joe Newby, my uncle Bullet, his real name's Harold. Uh, <laughs> They all had nicknames. Um, Carol, my dad Joe, his aunt, his aunt, my grandmother's sister Margaret, Benny, um, who was the brother in the family, his wife, uh, then Molly and Nathan Newby, Scarlett, do you see that? And um, my aunt Beverly. So Scarlett, I have lots of pictures of your parents. I need to share them with you. Okay, so that's. These are the registers. This is the register side of the family. So it wasn't as simple as typing in Maud Graham, which was my grandmother's second married name, um, because it hadn't been indexed. So how do you find them that way? I mean, the other way. <clears throat> because I was looking in those very early weeks of April 2022, the census hadn't been fully indexed, I had to find their enumeration district. And if you have, you can still use this. If you haven't used the 1950 census district finder feature on Ancestry, I highly encourage you to try it. Just if you like maps. I mean, it's just fun to look at it that way and not just a bunch of names on an enumeration sheet. So I searched for Clarendon, Monroe County, Arkansas, USA, through the district finder, and they give you this modern map. Here's, you know, like a Google map. I don't know that it's actually Google, but a Google map. Um, and then when you move your cursor over the district, it will bring up the sheets that you'll be, or the sections that you'll be looking at. And so when you click, it brings you to a more time period specific map. And you have your enumeration districts here, and those are clickable links which will take you to the pages. So I worked my way through the pages of the three districts for Clarendon, um, and I found, you know, until I found 429 or second. Of course, it was in district 48-11, not 48-9. So I had to go through 9 and 10 before I made it to 11. Um, it wouldn't have worked out easier, right? I, if I had been looking for something in nine, it would have ended up, I would have started with 11. So, so there they were, exactly where I expected them to be, in the same house they had lived in for most of the 20th century. Joan Newby, my dad's grandmother, was listed as the head of household because it was her house. And then her daughter, Maud, and her four children, Beverly Ann, Harold, Joe, and Carol. And if you went down the page a little bit, there are the neighbors a few houses down. They're the thoraxes, Miss Pearl and her six children. Every Register Family story involves a couple of thoraxes, <laughs> every single one of them. And 
if I don't, I didn't see if a thorax was on the thing. They are a loud group of people. They are an incredibly loud group of people. So, did I have to find, to use the district number or the district finder? Could I have really searched by name? Could I have waited? Actually, no. This enumerator's handwriting, it's not the best. It's not the worst. I've seen better. But the AI indexer, maybe, it may have been an actual human, transcribed my grandmother's last name as Garvin, not Graham. So unless I had looked, and she, it, even, it even lists the, the three registered children as Garvin. It just assumes the whole family is Garvin. Um, so if, unless I had searched for Maud Garvin or Joe Garvin, I wouldn't have found them without using the enumeration. So it was a lot of work for uh, the right cause. That's what I'm trying to say. <clears throat> okay, so we found the registers. They were easy. Um, so let's go in search of my mom's family. These are the Alstons, A-L-S-T-O-N. I assumed that they would be fairly easy to find. After all, my mom had talked about her childhood home at 1834 Romeo, Ferndale, Michigan, my entire life. So how hard could it be? I mean, I found this house in Clarendon pretty easily. Didn't take a whole lot of time. But I had lucked out with the registers. They were in the same house, in a small town, in an area I knew. So when I was going through those earlier enumeration districts, I was able to say, okay, I know where that street is so I can move on. I didn't have to go street by street. It's not as easy with my mother's family. So here in these pictures from my maternal grandparents collection, you've got Joanne Height, my grandmother, H-I-G-H-T, John Harold Alston, and my mother, Phyllis Alston, and she is actually standing outside of 1834 Romeo in that picture. <laughs> so let's fill in a little bit of family history. My maternal grandfather, John Harold Alston, was born and raised um, on Craven's Homestead, which is just up the road from Ozark, Arkansas, and Franklin County. In fact, if you drive west on Interstate 40, if you go just past that exit for Highway 23, that's the pig trail, um, you're going to drive right through Cravens because we sold the federal government the land to build that section of the interstate. John Harold was one of 13 children, and these were mountain folks. These were people working the land and making the land work for them. They were very industrious. At one point in time, and we have the records, the Austins owned most of Franklin County, like two centuries ago. Um, and they are listed as, count, as county founders. So here are pictures of my grandfather, John Harold Alston. Here he is with his Chrysler. Um, and then there is a picture of him with his brother Leonard. And Leonard was really the only one of his siblings that I knew well in my lifetime. So my maternal grandmother was born Joanne Height of Mulberry, Arkansas um, in Crawford County. Now, Joanne, you would spell it J-O-A-N-N, -N, I'm guessing, um, or Joe and Ann, but she spelled it and her mother spelled it Joan. So we're dealing with a Joan, no middle name. Um, in a census. So she is the daughter, the names get better, she is the daughter of John and Clyde Height. Now this was not a progressive family. Clyde was a woman. She was the youngest of four daughters. And as the family story goes, her father, Dixie, her father, Dixie, <laughs> um, just knew that this fourth baby was going to be a boy. Just knew it. So Clyde was selected, and Clyde was, she was named Clyde. Um, it stuck. John Hyde owned a general store in Mulberry, and they lived close by. So here we have photos of my maternal grandmother, Joanne Alston, John, Joanne Hyde Alston, and then Clyde Hyde with her 
you really can't see them well, but the two her two other children are there. And then uh, John Hyde. My grandparents, John Harold and Joanne, were married on March 15, 1946. Now, the family story goes that they got married in secret. They eloped. And then my grandmother returned home to her parents' house for several months, not telling them she was married. <laughs> um, I know very little about their courtship and early, early married life. They really didn't talk about it. I do know that she was engaged to someone else when she ran off with John Harold, and she gave her mother the engagement ring to give back to the other guy. It's true. It's true. <laughs> so, yeah, it's true. It's true. <laughs> Can't make this stuff up. <laughs> so by April of 1947, the Austins are living in Detroit, Wayne County, Michigan. And like many Southerners who lived through the Great Depression and World War II, my grandparents moved to Michigan in search of work. My mom was born there, and on her birth certificate, John Harold is listed as a factory worker, and Joanne is listed as a housewife. Okay, so back to the census. I found my father and his mother, and I'm sorry, I found my father and his family, and then I went in search of my mother. So, it was going to be complicated, of course. I knew she was born in Detroit, Michigan, and I knew at some point in 1950, my grandfather would build a house at 13, I'm sorry, at 1834 Romeo in Ferndale, Michigan. Hoping rather than believing it to be true, I searched the enumeration district just like I did for my, for my father's family. And in 1950, the neighborhood where their house should have been was either underdeveloped um, or the house hadn't been built yet. So you can't really see, um, I mean, there are streets laid out, but in the other enumeration districts, they have houses um, and they don't here. But it did, it pinned the address. It said, here's where it's supposed to be. So I decided to let the indexers do their job and I checked back in a few months. Probably got distracted by something else really. So fast forward to July of 2022. I go back to the census, 1950 census, and I search for John Harold Austin in Detroit, Michigan. And there he was. So on April 4th, 1950, when the enumerator stopped by, John Harold was living at 2397 East Grand Boulevard, apartment 111. That he was living with his brother, Leonard, who was the, listed as the head of household. It said that John Harold was working as a machine repairman at an auto parts factory. And all of that tracked with, with family oral histories. But where is my mother? She would have just turned three, her birthday's April Fool's Day. So she just turned three. She should have been there, right? She should have been there with her mother, Joanne, and her younger sister, Linda, who was two years younger. Now, it would not have been unheard of for my maternal grandparents to be living separately. They would do that several times in their life. So maybe if I searched for Joanne Austin, spelled J-O-A-N, in the 1950 census, I'd find them living somewhere else. So I searched first name Joanne, J-O-A-N, last name Austin, born 1926 in Arkansas. Um, and I got this message from Ancestry. Your search for Joanne Austin returned zero good matches. Now that's really weird for Ancestry. They like to give you all kinds, okay, Charles Fields shaking his head, but they <laughs> like to give you all kinds of bizarre, like how did you even think that was close? And so I, I, I had never gotten an actual zero results um, up until this point. So I thought, well, maybe they just aren't getting her name right. I mean, Rhonda is always saying, like, what if the person's got, like, a, I can't imagine my grandmother having a chub of tobacco, but, like, what if, what if she's not articulating herself very well? And she's very quiet. She's very shy. So maybe. So I thought, okay, 
Let me look for Phyllis in the 1950s census. So first name, Phyllis, B-H-Y-L-L-I-S, Austin, born 1947, Detroit, Wayne County, Michigan. Again, zero results, nothing. And I've even got like Phyllis is broad. So, you know, it's supposed to find all kinds of crazy spellings. So I thought I'll try crazy spellings, right? Phyllis is a really common name in the 1940s, and her sister Linda is a really common name in the 1940s. But people find it challenging to, to spell Phyllis. It's that PH. So I tried different spellings. Um, I mm -hmm. even tried Phyllis, F I L L I S, because I thought, you know, the enumerator might be a bad speller like me. Who knows? Still, no luck. So I thought, okay, we'll just get really vague. We'll just totally throw out the first name and just look for Alston's born in 1947 in Detroit. Again, zero matches. I can't, I mean, like at this point, it's just getting comical. It's like, is my, is this working? <laughs> um, so really, where is my mother? <laughs> so I started thinking about family stories. So early in my mom's life, Joanne, Phyllis, and Linda spent a lot of time in Mulberry um, while John Harold was working in Michigan. Most summers were spent in Crawford County. And in fact, there's another true story, Mom. In fact, um, my mother thought that her mother was her sister until she was about five years old. They spent so much time at the grandparents' house. So here is a series of photographs from my grandparents' collection, from my grandmother's collection. So we've got John Height um, with Phyllis and Linda, and then we've got Joanne Austin and Joy Hawkins, her sister, and the two girls, and then we've got my grandmother and the two girls, all different types of gear, all in Mulberry in the 50s, late 40s, early 50s. So it's possible I mean, they traveled a lot from Michigan to Mulberry. That seems like a really far, long trip, even today. They did it without stopping. Yes, there was a chamber pot involved. <laughs> so, so maybe in April 1950, my mother is in Mulberry. Maybe. So Easter was on the 9th that year. Easter's a big holiday for us. So I could totally conceive that they were at the grandparents' house for the holiday. John Harold still in, in Michigan working. So I searched for John P. Hyde, my great grandfather. And there he is in Mulberry. Um, the, new, the enumerator stopped by on April 3rd, 1950. And my great grandparents were home, as was their 29 year old son, Jack. But no Joanne, no Phyllis, no Linda. Where is my mother? <laughs> Okay, so maybe my grandfather was living with his brother in the city to save on commuting, and the girls were in Ferndale, Michigan, and he'd come home on the weekends. They would do a similar scenario to this when the family returned to Arkansas in the 1960s, and my grandfather was living and working in Ozark, and the, the three girls, my mom, her sister, and her mother, were here in Little Rock. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. So I thought, let me look for, let me look again for this address, 1834 Romeo. So here's a picture of my mom and her sister on those steps at 1834 Romeo. She can't be more than five. Linda can't be more than four. Um, so this is, so we're talking, you know, early 50s here. The house was there, maybe. Um, so back to the 1950 census district finder. I used this very successfully trying to find my dad, but Clarendon, Arkansas is a very small town. So the population of Clarendon in 1950 is 2,500. That's small. That's the population of Central High School. Um, Detroit in 1950 is 1 1.8 million. That's Detroit's peak population for the 20th century. Ferndale, the suburb that they were gonna call home, had a population of just under 30,000. So we're dealing with a lot more people in 2,500. So I searched for 13 
sorry. I, we live at 1318 Valley Road, which I've just given out over Zoom. Um, so 1834 Romeo in Royal Oak, um, Oakland County, Michigan. Yes, Royal Oak, not Ferndale. So I learned from another um, genealogy project that place names change. Postcode distinctions change. And so I started kind of looking like what's near Ferndale? What could have become Ferndale that's, that's in a bigger area? So Royal Oak, um, is just adjacent to Ferndale, and apparently in the early part of the 50s, they were all one place until it started growing more. So I looked at this enumeration district, 63-99. Um, again, when you click on the number, um, you get the pages, and it's 45 total pages. And so I went through page by page, line by line, looking for any because we could misspell things, last names, so I looked for any Joanne, any Phyllis, any Linda. In 45 pages, there's nothing. So I did this trick I do sometimes where I start at the back of the thing and I move forward. Still, nothing. Maybe the city directories. Let's, let's make one for the city directories, right? And yes. There, in the 1953 city directory for Royal Oak, Michigan, because there's not one for 1950, is John Harold Alston, a factory worker for Bond Aluminum in Detroit, and he's at home at 1834 Romeo. So, not 1950, but 1953. Let's go back to the census again. This is what we do all day. Um, so... <laughs> Let's focus on the street names, not the people names. Let's look at the street no names. So I actually walked, theoretically, you know, in my head, walked the way the enumerator walked. So on page 20, I find Romeo Street. And it's a bunch of the 2000 addresses, so that's not it. And then it jumps to page, so he's, he's going all the way up the street, and he's coming down another street, and he's going back up the, the other street. And so then it jumps to page 27, and it's got some, you know, 1985, 63, 47, those are house numbers, not years. And then on page 28, I get into what should have 1834. And you've got, you've got 1931, you've got this list of numbers, and there's this weird number that I can't make out. It looks like it's something, something 28, but I'm not really sure, still can't find it. Okay, so I'm a visual person. Let's go to the maps. Um, see if I can figure out exactly where this house is. Because if you Google 1834 Romeo right now, right today, it's there. The house my grandfather built is still standing there. It's got some more siding on it, but it's still standing there. Those steps are still there. So I just kind of stared at this for a while. I was kind of hoping it would do like one of those posters, you know, where you stare at long enough and then you see a tiger. <laughs> um, so the two blue circles on either side of the pink circle are 1834 Sims and Leach. So you would think that 1834 Romeo would be right there in that northeast corner, right there. But on this Google map, there's no house number. So I found this lovely thing. This is from Picturey, Oaklawn County, through time, historical aerial imagery collection. We historians love long names. Um, and this is through the Oaklawn County, Michigan government website. So they've got all of their aerial photos and you can click on, you can make them layer on top of each other. It's really cool. So this is the map from 1960, 1963, because they don't have anything from the 50s, and in the 40s, there's nothing here. Um, so again, I'm looking at these houses, and it, so by 1963, I mean, I knew by 1963 the house was there because mom had been living in the house. So it's there in the pink circle. But I still can't figure out you know, where it is in 1950. But the pin drawing 
for this map for that address drops on that house. So I think bingo, like maybe I got it. So I decided to use this map, which was closer than a 2022 map, and walk my way down the census sheet looking at the houses. So you can see here if you went one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, skipping six. Because that's that XX28 number. Still not finding my people. Where is my mother? In frustration, I just stared at this page. Uh, I looked at it over and over again. And at some point, my eyes dripped to one of the columns. I think it was dwelling number, or maybe it was farm and acres. And it says, note two. So enumerators love to do this kind of stuff. They love to make little notes. But if you're too busy looking at all the big columns, like name, um, you don't see these notes. So take a minute to look at these notes, because you might find something. So I see that it says note two. And I see that it says vacant. And so I started looking at the street numbers again. You've got, we've got 1843, 1828, and then 1858. Something missing, right? So I zoom in on line 13. It's not 1828, it's something 28. It quite possibly could be a 34, if I squint right. Um, and so this note that says vacant, if you go down to the bottom of that sheet, it says, note two, Van is building home for himself in spare time. Don't. <laughs> um, so that is my grandfather. Um, and that home is 1834 Romeo. Has anybody ever cried at their legacies and lunch? Okay, but still, <laughs> where the freak is my mother? So, still no trace of my grandmother, no trace of my mom, no trace of my aunt. At this point, I am starting to wonder if my grandmother, who is a painfully shy individual if y'all had known her. She would not be in this room with us today. <laughs> she wouldn't stay home. Um, she, I just, we, mom and I decided she just didn't open the door. Like, he knocked. I'm not going to the door. I'm not talking about a strange man. Um, so she didn't get counted. She and her daughters didn't get counted. Um, so I may never find her in the census. Um, but I will hunt. I will continue to hunt. I will continue to check because that's the fun part of genealogy, the mystery, the puzzle, the unknown. This is where my program was supposed to end. But wait, there's more. As I was putting the program together, I was going through photos and other scanned materials. Um, and I took the time to actually read my mom's birth certificate. I mean, you know, I just kind of looked at it. I was like, yeah, okay, check, mom's birth certificate. So there, right here, it says, under usual address of mother, it says 2397 East Grand Boulevard, apartment 213. So this is 1947. This isn't 1950. This is 1947. So 2397 East Grand Boulevard. Do you remember that address? It's okay. I didn't either initially. This is where my grandfather was living with his brother in 1950. But he was in apartment 111. And in 1947, there in the group, the, the wife, presumably, and the daughter are in 213. So back to the census. Who's in 213 in 1950? Well, it's not them. <laughs> it's Kenneth and Eleanor White, husband and wife. Kenneth is a press operator at an auto parts factory. The auto parts factory 
that my grandfather and his brother worked at? Maybe. Guess what? Kenneth White is from Mulberry, Arkansas. <laughs> Coincidence? Probably not, but I will keep trying to figure it out. Mom doesn't remember a Kenneth White. Um, but so still, no trace of my grandmother, my mother, and my aunt. But you can see that from April of 2022, then July of 2022 to now, I'm still finding more details. I'm still looking at things um, and seeing them in a new way. The moral of all of this is keep looking, but it's also open the door and be counted. <laughs> I mean, I know we don't do that anymore, but fill out your form. I mean, I know Mark Christ is, I mean, if you were around Mark Christ in April of a, of a zero number year, you hear a lot about the census, but it is truly important to be counted um, because it funds us. It funds the things we want to do. It gets us rep representation in Congress. So maybe at some point I will find them. <laughs> um, maybe they will appear by accident when I'm least when I least expect them. Rhonda always says they're hiding and they'll show themselves when they want to. Um, but I will keep looking. And as proof that she did exist, that she does exist, my mother's here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will take a couple of questions from here and then we'll look at the chat on Zoom if anybody has questions here. Could you explain the enumerator again? I mean, the um, the map process. Mm -hmm. The enumerator district? Yeah. Can I, well, no, I can't show you from over here because I'm not on Cal's Wi Fi. Um, let's see. So when you go, to Ancestry, and I did all of this using Ancestry's Library Edition, which is part of your library card services. Um, you can access Ancestry, and okay, this is not the question you're answering, that you're asking, but we're gonna, we're gonna plug it first. Um, you can use Ancestry at any CALS branch, and if you're joining us from outside of CALS service area, my guess is that your local library subscribes to Ancestry as well. So you go to Ancestry, and right now, at least, kind of in the middle of that front homepage, it says um, something like 1950 Enumeration District, and it says search maps or start here or something. It's not a leaf. They don't want you to click a leaf on this. So you click that, and you type in either your town, or you can type in the whole address um, to find it. And so it takes you to this which is obviously a modern map. Uh, and then it'll tell you when you hover, when you hover over your, your place, it'll tell you the enumeration district numbers. And then when you click on one, one of those, it will bring this up and then you click on which, which district you wanna look in. And so when we were waiting for AI and humans, to go through and index the census. This was a way where you could get a jump start. You could also go in and just start working and volunteering and, and helping index. Um, but this was, that's how the enumeration district works. So it was all, you know, very structured. Very, you know, they, they each enumerator had um, an area that they had to cover. And I highly recommend when you're looking at your census um, for your family or for your community or your town, look look at the name of the enumerator. It's going to be on the upper right hand corner, I think, for every census. Yes, Rhonda. Okay, yeah, it's up in the upper right hand corner. So, um, on in 1930 and 1940, my dad's mom was an enumerator, um, and in 1920, my Great, great, my maternal great grandfather was an enumerator. So their names show up. And, and so these were people in the community. So a lot of times in smaller towns, they knew a lot of details. They spelled people's names right. So does that answer your question? Yes, okay. yes ma'am. Uh, well, had you move, go back to the part where you talked about accessing this at CALS and kind of tell me oh. how you do it? Like, do you reserve time on a particular computer? Or? No, it's on all of our computers. Um, all the cows computers. <laughs> Let me say that. All of our in-house computers, 
you'll go to whatever branch. So you can go, you can go across the street to Roberts to the second floor and use any of our computers. But if you go to your branch, you'll um, either scan your library card or get a guest pass, and then you'll log on to a computer. The, the difference between this Ancestry Library Edition and what you would pay for is that you cannot create your own family tree in Ancestry and you cannot participate in discussion groups. You can look at discussion groups and you can look at family trees, but you just can't create them. There's no way. And then once you get into Ancestry, you just start searching. Um, they make it nav. They give you tell you how to navigate through to like get to that, for instance. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Thank so you. up until up until April of 2022, the the our like go to how to start would be find a identify a relative that you knew was alive on April 1 of 1940. And then you're going to go to the 1940 census. They could be an infant. And you could go to the 1940 census and find them. That's how you start. If you, but, but I encourage you to come and you, we love our branches and our branch folks are great. But if you want to get started, um, I encourage you to come and start your research at Roberts because we have the professionals, genealogists that can help you. Also, take our Finding Family Facts course, which is this Monday at 3.30. It is this Monday, right? Yeah, this is the second Monday. It's always the second Monday. And that moves. So. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? We got some questions on. Um, Antoinette, oh, Tony, hi. Um, Antoinette Johnson wants to know, is the census district finder only available for the 1950 census? Yes, I think. I'm looking at Rhonda. Or, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 1940. I don't know. I know it's not for all of them, or I haven't seen it for all of them. I think it's just for 50s. I think that was this kind of cool new feature that they came out with this time around. And it is a cool. I mean, I love math. So if you're going to give me a map over a sheet of words, I'll take a map any day. Uh, let's see. Mary says during the 1950s, farmland. Later was developed for World War II veterans families in 1954 in our area. It has two townships. How do I find the enumeration district of townships and do an overlay of the areas that were developed? Oh, you're getting complicated. Let's see. I could figure that out. I just don't know that I can do it right now. Um, I would start, Mary, looking at the community name um, and go, go broad and get more and more narrow um, because sometimes being as vague as possible with your search will help you. Not always, obviously, but it will, it will help. Um, but yeah, try that. And I'll think about that and see if I can figure out a, a better way to do that. Mary, can you say what community it is or can you type in the chat what community it is? Any other questions? Yes. This is sort of related. Is there anybody uh, at the library that can help with the GIS, geographical information systems where you could overlay the maps. I know uh, my friend Francis Carter is doing a lot of work with that, and I don't know how to make it work. I don't know. Okay. We want to do that with a couple of projects. We just haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Um, the ELA is one. Not, not like what you're talking about, but we want to use GIS on the ELA so that when you're in a place, you can say what entries, what history is around me. So I don't know. Kay, is UALR doing anything like that? Um, yes, they are. Uh, I don't know the details, but that's a, a big piece of the IT department. Okay. You might ask somebody, um, Dr. Field at 
UA Little Rock Center for Arkansas History and Culture. It can be. <laughs> it is not a volunteer day. I was trying not to volunteer, which is also in the Roberts Library. Which is also in Roberts Library, yes. So Mary says it's Rolling Meadows, Illinois. She wants to list, this is the farm land. She wants to list families who sold land to developers who planned the town. Hmm. I'll have to think about that. I'll have to ponder that. I'll have to go conference with Rhonda about that and see what we come up with. Yes, sir. Something that has helped me with things like that is also doing newspapers.com, which is also available through the library because you can put in a lot number or the name of a development and it will pull in things that Ancestry wouldn't have any reason to check. Yes. They'll yeah. also have a whole lot of dead ends and rabbit holes. <laughs> newspaper.com is great. Um, I also, because newspapers.com, especially here at Cows, we only have the Arkansas editions. You know, we only have the Arkansas papers. Um, so you can go to the Library of Congress. Their Chronicling America collection is papers in multiple languages from all over the country. Um, the state archives is working with them to get things digitized and you can search it's all OCR scans so you can search for names and it will come it will bring everything up sometimes it'll bring up a whole lot more maybe if I search my grandfather's name in Chronicling America I'll find something but um but yeah it'll it'll bring up a lot of stuff it's a really cool it's a really cool um service and it's free through the library of congress Yes, Kate. Is there what's the reasoning behind the 72, the number 72 for waiting for to release? That? It the the short answer is it is about as long as they thought most it's privacy. Okay. It's people's privacy. And they, they thought like at the time, that's about how long someone's gonna live. Mm -hmm. As we know, that is not the case anymore, but I think they're sticking with the 72 rule. Okay. I got a kind of shrug nod from the National Archives employee, and the, I'm gonna we're gonna quote you on that. It's not my division. <laughs> it's not my division. not know. But yeah, so that's what said. The 72 is a, it's a privacy thing. But if you can't find them, like you know, <laughs> that's real privacy. That's real privacy, right? Really, I mean, we do think she just didn't open the door. Like that was just so typical. Um, if you were at her house in Ozark later in her life, and um. If someone came to the front door, you knew you did not know you did not know that person because nobody came to that front door. Then you went to the you went to the garage door. Even. Um, but yeah, so she just I just we believe she just didn't answer the door. She didn't get counted. Michigan lost some money in representation on that. Any other questions? So we are open, um, the Roberts Library, second floor. We are open Monday through Friday, nine until six. Um, we're happy to help you on your genealogy questions. And then we're here Saturdays, 12 until four. Um, okay, now I have, I have to switch and not be the presenter anymore. And get to the bottom of my notes. Next month, next month is Mike Hood, who used to work for the city of Little Rock, and he's going to talk about the Little Rock, Maumelle, and Western Railroad. Um, so mark your calendars for Wednesday, January 3rd. Remember us after the holidays, January 3rd at noon. We're going to be here again um, at UA Little Rock downtown. So if you come in person, you get a free cookie. Um, if you join us virtually on Zoom, you don't get a free cookie. Um, but we'd love to see you anyway. Um, and also, please don't forget about Second Friday Art Night this Friday from 8 until 5. It's going to be a holiday extravaganza of Santa Claus and cookies and crafts. So please join us right here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.
you know, traces maternal blood. Oh, I can do that. I know that. I mean, how to work that. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. Yeah, 